Gangster of Hibernians were founded in New York City in 1836. And they were founded because they, the Irish got together in that year at that time because the Know Nothings, an anti-immigration political party, a heavily Protestant political party, was in the midst of burning down Catholic churches in New York City. And when the Irish found out that there were a group of Know Nothings that were threatening their local church, St. James Church in Lower Manhattan, they gathered together, they came out of their homes and their, their tenement buildings, and they surrounded the local church. And they protected St. James from being burned down. And they got together as really a group of Irishmen after that, and Irish women, I'm sure, and decided that we needed to form an organization that will help protect our Catholic churches and our own property from being burned down by the know-nothings. So out of that came the ancient order of Hibernians. division has been centered around a neighborhood and a church and that's the way it's developed you know now since so uh, we were founded here back in the Bronx in, in, in 1836 and, and the four divisions that are left division three that I'm a member was founded in 1867 the other three divisions were founded after World War II uh, but they are focused around a local church and a local community but you can live in Kingsbridge and be a member in Throg's Neck so there's no rules about uh, membership. You can live in Yonkers. Uh, we have one of our most active brothers in the East Bronx who lives in Glendale, Queens. So it doesn't really make a difference where you live. You just have to be interested in being part of the Hibernian Division and the work that they do. I joined the Ancient Order of Hibernians in 1977. So I did. I joined uh, a Division 9 in the Bronx. I met this friend who belonged to the EOH and he said, you have stopped working at night now. He said, come on, work, join the AOH. So I went in with him in 1978. I belong to uh, Division 4 in the Bronx, and I joined back in 93. Uh, I was, was in the Hibernians in the Bronx, uh, in, in Manhattan, Division 9, Manhattan. And then when I moved up to the Bronx, I became Division 9 in the Bronx. Frank took me to the meeting last year, and I joined up. And then I went to one meeting, I went to a reception. I found out about the Hibernians by a man the name of um, Oliver Charles. Uh, I was always kind of aware of their existence. I had a contact uh, name from a friend of ours in Ireland. Came out and his name was uh, Seamus O'Doherty. When I saw him, I walked up and said, Seamus, he goes, Donnelly Donovan, kind of talk to my name is Seamus O'Doherty, uh, will you join, you'll join the Ancient Order of Hibernians. I said, my hand out, I said, very pleased to meet you, I will, who are they? I had never heard of the Ancient Order of Hibernians until I came to this country. The Ancient Order of Hibernians promotes um, Irish culture, it promotes, you know, the reunification of Ireland, and it promotes the supporting of the church. But it does so much more than just that. We do things in unity together. We try to do things that would be for a better purpose uh, throughout the lo local area of the Bronx or the city. And Christian charity is extremely important because if you raise money, or whatever the event is that you raise money, the worst thing to do is keep it in your savings account. They're involved in their local community and, and that's kind of what attracted me to it. We're not an organization that looks to raise money and hold on to it, but an organization where truly, if you're doing things the right way, you want to spend that money. Spend the money on local organizations that are doing terrific work, especially here in the Bronx, which we've done uh, across the borough for the betterment of not just the Irish, but the non-Irish who live here. The AOH is in a very interesting stage right now where it's evolving into a newer thing, and I think it's a very exciting time, which is kind of why I'm very excited to be involved in it, because I get to be at the, at the front of it. 1956, June 14th, I got on the boat in Ireland, in Dublin. 11 days coming across. It was scary, life jackets on, waves, but we made it. I came through the United States in the, in the late 50s, um, not because I had to, but it just happened to fall on me. I was born in a little town of Lewisburg, County Mayo, about half a mile from the Atlantic Ocean, and about four miles from Crowpatrick. 
In the two years I was in Cork, I stayed in a uh, boarding house that was owned by two sisters. And their two nieces and a nephew were living in the, in the house and I became great friends with the three of them. We went everywhere together. And by degrees, one of them was thrown in my, in my side all the time. And I was getting very serious. I knew she was serious. And we started crying. I said, Eileen, when you come to America, we'll get married. She said, I will. And I called, wrote to my brother here in this country and asked him if I told him I want to go to America. And Eileen came. After we got married, we lived in 1339 University Avenue, 170 Street in the Blanc. We lived there for about five years. And then I was told that there was a house for sale up in Collier Avenue, 231st Street, and I bought it. I met up with a guy by the name of Gene Farley from Cavan, Chris Looney from Clare, and myself. We started a band. And we played a lot when we got started, and we called it the Hibernians. And that band was going up until about four or five years ago. I still do a little gig for the Pioneer Association at, every year, just past time. Last night I had a pleasant dream I woke up with a smile I dreamed that I was back again The day rolled over inside I wanted economic opportunity and I felt like I would never be able to achieve any of that in Ireland. So, uh, you know, Ireland in the 1980s and early 90s isn't a picture of what it was today. It would have been more similar to Ireland in the 1950s. You know, the, the Celtic Tiger came in in the mid 90s and that really changed things. But by then I was living in America and, and to be honest, I was having a great time. The ancient Order of Hibernians is built on fate. My father, he was a Hibernian back in Ireland. That's where, more or less, it instilled into me the importance of, uh, of the AOH. When I heard the history of it, I'm like, yeah, this is important to me because it's heritage. So, you know, if I can help keep my heritage alive, here and, and pass it on, then, then I'll, I'll do that. Young or old, we have to remember our history. Whether we're Irish, Italian, or African American, or Hispanic, our history is very important to us. And where we came from, and what life was like in that country that your parents or your grandparents lived in. Well, when you've seen the motto, unity, friendship, and Christian charity, that's what got me going with those. And it's a good organization, been to help a lot of people. They're great guys. I mean, they've loads of experience. Just, just to listen to the stories they have to tell you is worth the admission, which is nothing, it's free. What I'm doing, like as a historian, I'm giving them part of Irish history that they actually knew, knew, knew nothing about. And I go into very, very detail with it. Like I started 17 years ago. I do think that there's an incredible amount of experience that they have that they could impart onto younger people that, that would really help them and guide them. I like that kind of uh, scenario, the, the mentorship kind of program thing that's involved in it, which is not even a part of its, you know, brief. It's just something that happens kind of impromptu. We have four divisions of Hibernians in the Bronx. We have uh, one over here in the West Bronx, which is a Kingsbridge Riverdale uh, division. We have one in Woodlawn, or Woodlawn Wakefield division, and then two in the East Bronx. One what I would call a Frog's Neck division. And the fourth one, which is a, a composite of other East Bronx neighborhoods, from Allerton through Morris Park to Pelham Bay and Country Club. And we're approximately uh, 150 brothers at this time. And where we are right now in Woodlawn Wakefield uh, is probably the largest, or it is the largest division in Bronx County. They have close to 60 members. And they have members who are as old as in their 80s and as young as their, their late 20s and early 30s. When I walked in, I was um, probably about 27. I was definitely the youngest person in the room. And uh, I, um, I, I went back every month, I stuck with it, and uh, I became president in 94 to 98. And I tried to get a lot of young people involved. We started up a lot of programs. 
softball. Uh, we started uh, sponsoring the, um, uh, the uh, St. Raymond's football team, which we still do to this day. I uh, ran a golf outing back then, we raised some funds, and um, my involvement now is I run the, uh, the golf outing for them every year, and we try to raise as much as we can, and we, we support uh, eight local Catholic schools. Our division gave out checks of $500 to a graduating eighth grader at St. Francis E. Chantel in Throgs Neck, at St. Benedict's in Throgs Neck, at Lady Assumption in Pelham Bay, and St. Francis Xavier in Morris Park. I'm very pleased that my division, Division Three, did that in 2012 for the first time and then continued in 2013, 14, 15, and this June, we will be at the graduations giving out those checks to those local schools and to those youngsters who can, and a family that can really use that money because of the higher cost of high school education. You have all these wonderful people involved in this wonderful organization that genuinely want to help their community for no gain or reward for themselves. It's, I, it, I would say it's the truest form of a not-for-profit organization because nobody makes anything out of it. It's very challenging to get young people involved because I, I, I know for a fact, probably back in the 60s, you could, you know, uh, if you were someone of influence in the ancient order of Iberians and someone, as they say, came off the boat, you could get them a job, you know, or you got them involved in, in playing football and you got them a job and they joined. But that's not how it, how it works today. It is true that it's, it's a little difficult to get a lot of the uh, young men who are in their 20s and 30s to join, but this is a problem with organizations throughout the, the borough. It's a problem throughout the country. I don't feel that a lot of the stuff that's out there caters to me or the things that I want to do. I feel like the AOH does. Now, since I started with the AOH, I've been able to bring in, you know, five or, or six people but like that and anything else, for things that you want to be involved in, you have to be willing to give up your time. People are gonna to have to join um, because they want to, because you're offering something. It used to be that time was not a very precious or expensive commodity, and now it is. Their time is really you know, taken by you know, working, both parents are working, the kids are involved in everything. So when you have younger kids, where do you find the time to join an organization like this? That's why most of the members we have are people who join when their kids are, have left college. You see them coming in. And it's funny, some of the people join now because yeah, they, we gave their kid a, a $500 check or whatever in 1994, 1995 when they were playing football. And they say, you know, I always wanted to join and they'll come in and they'll join. So. It's almost like we're, we're reaping the, the fruits of our labor from 20 years ago. To be involved locally in some organization takes, takes a bit of work. They've been very successful here in, in, in Woodlawn because they have at least, I'd say, a dozen of the brothers who are under the age of 35. And they've joined because they felt it was an organization they wanted to be part of. And they're now working to frame you know, what it is that the division will stand for, what organizations they're going to be looking to fund, and I think they, they appreciate the fact that they can talk to somebody who's in his 70s and 80s and also be with their own brothers who are in their 30s and, and have a good time. Many were born in Ireland, so they're able to make a connection from back home, whether they're in their 30s or in their, in their 70s. Going through life with an organization, it's, it's like growing up with a friend, right? You, the friends you've had in college are different than the friends you made after you got married and, you know, you're always making new friends. But if you're lucky enough to have one friend that you met while you were growing up, that you went through your life together with, it's a shared experience that just can't, there's no, nothing, nothing comes even close. There is nothing like in this world to have a friend. To have that, that feeling. It lifts you up. It gives you a feeling that I am safe. We are safe if we have good friends and that we can trust people, trust, integrity. I think that it's very confusing for young people nowadays what's good or what's bad, what's on the internet, what's not on the internet, all these kind of things. Um, but I do think that for my son, I would like my son to, to be immersed in the Irish culture. Um, 
I think learning how I played music and danced and sang and did all this stuff in the choir that I would like him to do. I think there's nothing wrong with a boy being able to do all that kind of stuff. Um, I'd like him to play sports and football and hurling and all those other Irish things. Um, but I, I do think that just particularly from the AUH, that would be the thing I would like for him to, to, to partake of. That the AOH was there as an organization to help Irish people in a country where they needed help. <laughs>